So it's a pleasure to be here. Um, as you heard, this is my farewell lecture, uh, number 42, and it's been a joy and a fantastic opportunity to do this, do this lecture. So of course, my first slide, I would really like to, uh, first of all, thank the National Nonprofit Association for giving me the opportunity to, to, uh, to take this tour and travel around the world and talk about my research. And many of you might be familiar with the fact that it's the Research and Educational uh, Foundation with the National Groundwater Association that's under this tour. Many of you might also be familiar with the fact that it's been going for a number of years. It started in 1986, and it's reached over 80,000 professionals, students, faculty around the world. And I'm going to look up in this book now because apparently this little schematic here is tucked into an appendix somewhere at the back of this report. Uh, someone told me that at one of the places I went to, so I'll be excited to go look that up. But of course, the, the, the a serious uh, honors Henry Darcy's seminar work from 1856, where he came up with the groundwater equations that we still use today. So my take on that is something slightly different. Um, it's, we're talking groundwater, we're talking groundwater flow, uh, but what I want to talk about is what is happening inside the pores. And uh, my title is, is even more appropriate today than it has been the rest of the year because we're in Vegas. Mm -hmm. um, but what I want to talk about is how we have used a small scale imaging technique to learn something about what's, what's going on with groundwater, <clears throat> what's happening in pores. And when I started preparing for this, for this uh, lecture series, I came across this report, it's called Underground Intelligence, um, written by Ed Strusik, uh, who's a writer and journalist at Queen's University in Canada, and he refers to groundwater as the sixth great lake. But he also very appropriately talks about groundwater as being out of sight and out of mind for many. Even though we know that groundwater is a resource in terms of drinking water, um, other types of water supply for millions and millions of people, we don't exactly know what's going on. And here's where I have a little, a little nod to, to Mike and Hannah, uh, because uh, he has a statement somewhere that says, that, that says, and yet, like comedian Rodney Dangerfield, groundwater gets no respect. And I know I'm dating myself horribly by actually admitting to the fact that I know who Rodney Dangerfield is. I don't know if anyone else in the audience does, but Mike obviously does. But, but there's, there's some real truth in this, because, um, we don't know exactly what's going on with groundwater. So we're used to looking at the hydrologic cycle. We're used to looking at cloud formation. We can see rain fall on the ground. We can see water flowing in rivers and streams. But by the time the water infiltrates into the ground, we lose that exact ability to track what's going on. So that's what I've been wanting to talk about. And that's what we're doing with this imaging technique. We're able to go into pores, of course, at very, very small scale. It's very fundamental research. But we can actually go in with this technique and look and see what are the fluids doing inside the pore space. So the first thing, um, well, first of all, when I, I prepared for the lecture again, I was, you know, you start thinking about what's going on with groundwater at the moment, what are some of the concerns, and of course, we continue to grow as a population. Uh, we continue to urbanize uh, our cities. We pave over pervious surfaces and, and uh, generate impervious surface, uh, thereby we limit recharge to our groundwater reservoirs. We don't know what's going to happen exactly as the climate changes. In some places, it's going to get uh, warmer and wetter. In Oregon, like in California, we are uh, struggling at the moment. We don't get enough snow during the winter anymore, so we don't have that storage capacity during the summer. So we're relying more and more on groundwater flows that sustain themselves throughout the year. But at the same time, the, that groundwater resource is also vulnerable um, when, when we don't get a lot of other water. So there are a number of things, uh, kind of more modern type of, of problems. The two um, things I wanted to talk more, more about um, is uh, contamination from industrial uh, sources, traditional non aqueous based liquids when we have oil spills from a gas station or from industrial, uh, from a factory or something like that. And then the newer, um, the newer uh, problems related to energy development. When we're doing oil and gas extraction, uh, storing CO2 in the sur subsurface, what is that doing to our groundwater? Are there potential threats that, that we should be concerned about? And especially with the fracking boom that's happening at the moment, I think there's some things that, that we need to look at. And the technique that I'm going to talk about could potentially help us understand some of these problems. 
So I want to talk about inside. We've gotten from this, this core scale imaging technique. And I don't want to claim that, that this is something that I've invented, but there's been many research groups over the years. We've spent a lot of time mostly looking at how do, how do we take a, a rock, or how do we take a soil sample and image it with x-rays and characterize the pore structure. And that's a whole, that's, it's a science in itself. But I've been much more interested in what are the fluids doing inside that pore space. And that's kind of become a specialty for my group to look at what are, what are multiple fluids doing when they interact in the pore space? How do they compete uh, for that space? And with this technique, we can measure a number of different things. You can see uh, I have a kind of a, a smorgasbord of things that I want to talk a little bit about each, each type of measurement and what we can learn from it. And then I also want to talk a little bit about what's coming next, what can we expect in the future um, from the, uh, in using this technique in, in groundwater research. So now I'm going to take a, a 90 degree turn here because I'm going to present a lot of data and I think it is helpful for you to know how the data is generated so you can form your own opinion about how accurate or what the quality of that data actually is. So I want to introduce the technique. It's x-ray tomography. Um, that uh, term comes from to section and to write. And many of you will be familiar with the technique from when you have been to the doctor um, if you have a CAT scan or something like that to see if anything is going on, uh, in this case probably a whole, not a whole lot, but uh, you know when you have a chest x-ray or something like that, you are being exposed to a, a, a tom tomographic scan, a CAT scan. And what we basically, what's different from having a chest x-ray where you just get one single slice, or when you have a, a, a dental x-ray, we get one slice. And that means you can't, sit, you can't resolve things in 3D. So when we take many of these around the object and then mathematically reconstruct it and put it back together, we can actually get 3D information inside of big objects. And the correlation to groundwater from this is, of course, that we can do exactly the same thing with a soil sample or rock sample. We can see what's happening inside. <clears throat> So I want to talk, there's going to be probably six, seven slides about how we actually do the imaging again, because I, I want you to know where the data is coming from. Something like this, and this, this would be where you would get your, your CAT scan from. Those can go down to an um, image resolution of about half a millimeter, is, is the finest you can resolve with that. There are also uh, um, industrial x-ray systems that you can buy off the shelf now, or if you custom built. With those, you can now go down to nanometers. Both of these types of systems rely on what's called polychromatic radiation, that's the full spectrum of, of X-rays. Synchrotron-based system stands out from that because you can turn the radiation from a synchrotron, from a particle accelerator, and you can turn it monochromatic, you can filter out everything else. And I'm going to show you the advantage to doing that. With this system, we've been imaging mostly between 2 to 10, 15 microns or so, but you can actually go down to nanometer resolution with some of these systems too. I want to mention one thing while we're talking about resolution, and that is when, when you know when you take a, a photo, if you want to get closer, you, you, you can't fit as much, right? It's exactly the same thing here. So if you want to look at a sample, uh, there's a lot of people interested in shales at the moment. Uh, they want to look at porosity in shales. We're talking nanometer type of <coughs> uh, features. To do that, your sample needs to be very, very small. Um, it has to be, to get 100 nanometer resolution, ballpark, your sample needs to be about 100 micron. There's about a, a factor of 10 to the 3, um, a, a ballpark. It's improving with, with bigger detectors and things like that. But that's been the, the way it's, uh, it's traditionally been. <clears throat> so a little bit more about how we actually generate these images. Uh, we're relying on how x-rays uh, interact with matter. We have an object here that we want to look at, see right here. And then we have x-rays coming in from the right of a certain intensity. Some of them get absorbed by the material we're looking at. And then we have a low intensity of x-rays coming out the other side. And the relationship between the incoming and the outgoing x-rays is this here. We have the thickness of the material x. And you can see the only thing we don't know then is mu, which is called the limit attenuation coefficient. And what we basically do with this imaging technique is measure variation in mu and linear attenuation uh, coefficient. It tells us how much the sample is absorbing x-rays. 
And by mapping that onto a camera, we generate these grayscale images of, of, of absorbance, actually. And that's what we use for uh, the imaging. So as I said, a lot of our work has been done at a synchrotron facility. Part of the reason for that is that we can get really, really brilliant x-rays, um, um, and brilliant in the sense that we get an enormous photon flux. So if you look at the, the uh, energy spectrum over here, here we have uh, energy of the x-rays, and then on the, the y-axis we have what we call brilliance. Uh, photon flux, basically. So here's a conventional system. That would be your CAT scan or your lab x-ray that you, you have in a research lab somewhere. And then you have synchrotron radiation here. And you actually have to multiply these by 10 to the 9 to even just get them on the same plot. So the difference between a CAT scanner and the amount of x-rays you get from synchrotron is the equivalent of a tiny, tiny little piece of millimeter-sized python tubing in the lab and the biggest fire hose you can find out there. Um, so you get an enormous flux from a synchrotron radiation source. Um, so I have mainly been using uh, this one here. It's the advanced photon source, and it's located at Argonne National Lab in, in Illinois. So my lab is actually in Chicago, or at least a, a good part of my lab is, is in Chicago, and we fly out there and do the experiments. And the way we do it then, so we have x-rays coming out here. They go through what's called a monochromate. I'll show you on the next page what that does. Next slide. Um, we put our little um, soil rock sample here, and it rotates on the stage. X-rays go through. Some of them get attenuated. And then this little device here, the scintillator, converts the x-rays into visible light. And then all you have to do is put a camera in front of it, and you can, you can get these maps of attenuation that way. So what's so special about synchrotrons? Well, it's the fact that we have enough radiation to actually filter out a particular energy. Let's see if this will work. Yes, it does. So, so we have light, uh, uh, synchrotron light coming out here. And then we use what's called monochromator, two silicon crystals that you can angle at different angles. Uh, following Bragg's law, that will then dictate what energy you get um, for the, for the x-rays uh, coming out on this side. That, that energy will depend on how you angle the um, <coughs> monochromator. And that means that you can take, we basically take 99.9%, .9%, well, a very, very high percentage of the radiation coming out of the particle accelerator, and we throw it away. Because we only want to keep one particular energy. We want to have monochromatic x-rays. And the reason for that is that you can then use contrast agents in a very, very creative way to get really, really co good contrast in the images. So there's an example here you can see. In this case, we've put cesium chloride in the water, in the, the water phase here. Um, cesium has high x-ray absorbance, so that means we get very nice contrast in our water. So these, these are cross-sections through a single glass bead sample. Uh, we're moving further and further away from reality now. We're working with glass bead samples quite a lot. Um, but you can see over here, now here we're imaging below the cesium edge, and that means that everything is just kind of gray, it's hard to see what's what. If we roll the energy up so that we are um, above the, the cesium edge, this is the photoelectric absorption edge for cesium, you can see we get very, very high contrast. And it becomes very easy to distinguish the different features in, in the image. So here we have beads in gray, we have some air that's black, and then the white face is the water with the cesium. If we, get, uh, if, if we have a need for it, we can then subtract these two images from each other, and then you can see the only thing that stands out nicely is the water, because that has different attenuation here than it does over here. OK, one, two more slides about how we generate the data. But again, like I said, I think this is really, really important, because I'm going to show you a lot of the data that I tend to trust because I know it's been generated, but I think it's very important that you, you know where it's coming from as well. So the next thing we need to do is to actually um, segment the images. We need to classify the, the different features. So all of you here in the audience can see that this is a, this is a slice through, um, it's a sandstorm core, and you can see that there's some dark space, that's our porosity. The gray is just the, the sand grains, and then we have some bright, um, high, um, high density minerals that are white things. If I gave this image to everyone here in the audience and asked you to figure out what is the porosity of that sample? You would want, I would want you to figure out where, in terms of intensity in this plot up here, sliding it back and forth, where do you put the, the, the slider and say, everything over here is pore space, everything on the other side is rock. 
So basically, how do you get the cross? If I ask everyone here in the audience to do that, you will all give me a different answer. Because this is what I call a pesky histogram. It's a really, really bad histogram. There is no indication of where you should set that threshold. So basically, when our images look so that the histograms look like that, we tend to redo the experiments. <laughs> but they never do because we know how to do it now. But having shown you a very bad histogram, um, I will, of course, show you a perfect histogram, too. So here, again, the, the human combination of our, our brain, our processing unit, and, and, and our visual perception is very good at, at seeing what's what. So everyone here can see that we have some glass beads, we have uh, some air here, and we have some water out here. But what we need to do is to convert that. So these are 64,000 uh, different intensity values here. And we want to convert them into just three so we can make measurements on them. How you get from here to here is very important, and that's why we rely on the histogram. Um, so here we have a very nice histogram because you can see here, it's very easy for all of you to see where we should set these thresholds to separate these three different things here. So here we have a peak for the air phase, we have one for the glass beads, and we have one for water over here. We can also get a computer to do it automatically, which is even better because then there's absolutely no error involved. Um, so, these are the kinds of histograms we want to look at because once we've made this, you know, getting gotten from all these thousands of grayscale values over to having these three different values, we can start making all kinds of measurements. But if we don't do this correctly, everything we do from here on is incorrect as well. Okay, so that was enough about how the, the images are generated. So I want to talk about some of the measurements we're making. <coughs> And I have a statement here that we're going beyond digital rock technology because in the petroleum industry there's, there's so many companies that are working on characterizing pore space. And what we're particularly interested in is what are the fluids actually doing in that pore space. <clears throat> so uh, one thing we started out measuring a while ago was interfacial area. So I tend to work with mostly on unsaturated flow or oil contaminants in groundwater or CO2 injection into brine where we have multiple phases uh, present in the pore space. And in many of those cases, it's interesting for us to figure out what is, what is the area, the contact area between these different phases. So the way we do these experiments, we, we uh, set up a little sample here, and we can run flow in and out, so we can run drainage and, and, and inhibition experiments. And every green point on this curve here, we have saturation and capillary pressure here. Every point on this curve here is a place where we stop and collect an image. And we collect, you can see the little brown section up here that's actually where we're making the measurement. It's about five millimeters tall. And we get something like that that we can then make measurements on. And what we're particularly interested in is the relationship between saturation, this is the water saturation, capillary pressure, which is the pressure between the, the pressure difference between the wetting and the non-wetting phase when you're looking at an interface like that. And then we wanted to measure something, we wanted to measure a third axis on this, so pointing out into the room, because some of my colleagues have suggested that to better describe multi-phase flow, we actually need that information. So Najib Hassan Saad and Bill Gray have been working for um, decades now. Uh, their theories have uh, diverged, but they continue to work on it. And what they've been suggesting is that the traditional hysteresis you see, maybe it's better if I go back here. So you can see that drainage has a different curve than inhibition. So the, the, the relationship is hysteretic. And what they're suggesting is that that hysteretic relationship is actually, it's there because we're looking at a 2D projection of something that's a three-dimensional relationship. So what they're saying is we need to add on the third axis here, that's the interfacial area with between, between the fluids. And that will account for all of the different configurations you can have at different pressures and saturations. So that should essentially give us a unique relationship then. And one of the first things we wanted to do was we set out to see if we could prove this. So you can see here we have a surface now, instead of that 2D relationship, for drainage and inhibition, and you can see the two surfaces actually land perfectly on top of each other. So that was fun to, to at least for this very simple system we're looking at, we showed that, that we, we were able to produce data in support of that theory. Another place where this interfacial area becomes really important is if we're trying to clean up contaminants in groundwater. 
Um, if you look, this again is a, a little uh, cross section of one of our images. We have some oil here now, and we have some water. And let's say we want to do a traditional pump and treat cleanup of ground water. Well, the rate at which you're going to be able to dissolve that oil out of here is going to be uh, controlled by the area that's available for that dissolution. And traditional methods have tended to use the entire area of the oil block as a measure of that uh, mass transfer, you know, that area that goes into the mass transfer relationship. And what we're arguing is that the only place where something's really happening is where you have an oil-water interface, not where you have oil up against the grain. If you look at the difference between those two areas, you can see here, if we're down at low water saturation, we are overestimating that area that's available for mass transfer by a factor of 5 to 10. And that, of course, means that if we're trying to predict how long it's going to take us to pump and treat, I'm using the simplest scenario here, but how long would it take us to clean up that oil? Well, we're going to underestimate that time by a factor of 5 to 10 as well. So, um, really important in, in that respect as well. Another place where the facial area uh, turns out to be uh, relatively important is when we're looking at uh, geologic storage of CO2. We inject the CO2 into the ground, and we then uh, one of the one of the measures of, of storing the CO2 is for it to dissolve into the brine that's that's present there. And we don't have very accurate relationships for how that dissolution is going to take place. But with this technique, we can actually take pictures as it dissolves over time. And from that, we can develop very, very accurate mass transfer relationships for that dissolution as well. <clears throat> um, so I said I often work with, with uh, systems with multiple phases in it. Um, I got an NSF project funded with, with Bill Gray and Casey Miller from the University of North Carolina a couple of years ago, and they basically said that this thing you did with the two phases, with the, you know, looking at hysteresis, can you do that for a three-phase system too? And um, so we set out to do that. And in this case, we're now looking again cross-section through our <coughs> proxy for a soil here. We have glass beads, we have water, we have some gas in here, and then we have oil, which are these um, light gray areas here. You can probably see them better over here. Because what's, what's neat about this is that the, um, the oil is the intermediate wet phase, and it's a spreading system as dictated by the interfacial tension. That means that the oil will spread between the gas and the water phase. You get these long, thin films. So that in itself is, is somewhat interesting. Um, we were after trying to prove whether we get a unique relationship between pressure saturation and area for this system as well. We're still working on the data. There are some issues, but it looks very preliminary, like we're actually going to end up with a unique relationship when we have three phases as well. And this, of course, would be the situation where you are um, above the groundwater table, you have gas and water in the pore space, and then you might have an oil contaminant as well. Now, what's really important in that situation is that if you have these spreading films, these very long spreading films, if you're thinking about cleaning that, that oil out of your beta zone, out of your unsaturated zone, it's going to be a very different type of cleanup job when you have these long spreading films than if you just have three phase napping. Um, so it's important to understand this as well. Um, another place this becomes very important is when we're looking at CO2 injection into the depleted oil reservoirs, and we're thinking that the CO2 is going to go in there and it's going to dissolve in the brine. But it's not going to do that if it's coated in a thin layer of oil uh, because of the oil that's, that's already present in the reservoir. So these kinds of pictures is one of the reasons why I like this imaging technique because you can actually, this is a picture of the gas phase, uh, a three-dimensional rendering of the gas phase in that little um, cutout that we're looking at. And you can take this puzzle piece and basically plunk it in over here and see that this spaghetti-type uh, film here is spreading on that gas phase. So this is, this is a, a 3D rendering of, of the oil in that system as well. So I have one slide here because I just wanted to mention that I do work with modelers too. I used to do modeling myself, but the experiments have gotten so complex over the years that we don't find much time to do modeling anymore, but we try to work with people who do that. So in this case, this is work that I've done with a colleague at the University of Arizona, Marcel Schad. And he's been running a four-scale lattice Boltzmann simulation uh, of these experiments as we do 
we, we conduct the experiments, he runs them all, and then we look and see how they compare. Um, and you can see in the cases, so these are the, um, these are the simulations of here. Now these are the experiments up here, and these are the simulations down here. And we're actually able to produce very, very similar distributions of red as oil and blue as water in the first place. So we can use these kinds of images also to uh, verify new numerical models. Um, and that was mainly what I wanted to get across with this slide. Okay, so one other thing we've done with, with these kinds of images is something that I'm really excited about because the quality of the images have gotten good enough now that we can actually measure when we have these interfaces between the fluids, we can measure the curvature of that interface from the image. Um, and we did that, this, this all started out, I had a, a former PhD student who needed to, he had written a curvature measuring algorithm for some 2D micromodel experiments we were doing, and he wanted to verify, and I said, why don't you look at some of our old older um, 3D data, where we also have measured pressures as they're measured uh, with transducers external to the sample. So what he did is he generated the, the interface between the oil and the water in the system, which is what you're seeing here. And then he threw away everything that was trapped or snapped off. So this is, this is only oil and water that's connected to the top and to the bottom, which means it's connected to the transducer that's, that was connected up there, the top of the sample and the one at the bottom of the sample. That transducer is measuring the capillary pressure in the system. And from, if we measure the average curvature of this interface, we can use the Young Laplace equation. We can then estimate the capillary pressure by looking at the two principal, principal radii of curvature for, for, for this image and multiplied by the interfacial tension. And we'll then, then get an estimate from the images of what the pressure state of the system is. We then, he then compared it to the, the pressures that we measured externally with pressure transducers, and you can see we were kind of uh, surprised how, how well um, the two actually match each other. Because there's lots of opportunity for, for introduction. <coughs> now this is in itself is, is, is interesting, but what I think is really neat is if we, take, if we instead look at all of the, the blobs that he threw away, the disconnected phase, we have absolutely no way of tracking what's going on with, with, with that part of the system because you can't put a, you, even if you could make a micro tensiometer small enough to put into these little samples, you wouldn't know where to put it because you don't know where the blob is gonna, gonna end up. But this technique gives us an opportunity to actually measure the pressure of this connected phase. And one of the things we've been able to see is that as you go through so again, this is a 3D rendering of, of uh, these are oil blobs that are being trapped off as we are injecting more and more water into the system, as, so we're increasing the water saturation. We have one little oil blob here, we have another one here, and you can see we get more and more that, that, that gets snapped off from the main, water, uh, main oil body. And what we can see if we look at the histogram, you know, a, a distribution of the curvatures in these images, you can actually see, you can see it by the colors too, that they change colors, so it's indicating that they're changing curvature as they're being snapped off. So we can track the pressures in the system while we're doing this. So I'm really excited about this. I haven't found a very good use for it yet, uh, but it will be an NSF proposal someday. There is one thing we've, we've, uh, where we've put it to good use. Um, I mentioned the three-phase experiments that we did before and that we had some problems with it. We were suspecting while we were conducting the experiments that the wettability of the system was changing from hydrofo hydrophilic to hydrophobic. And we got suspicious of that both because of the, the way the pressures were behaving and we started to look at the images and we could see that, that some of the interfaces were not flipping the right way. So we use this technique of measuring curvatures, and what you can see, it actually helped us as a forensic tool to figure out what was going on in the system. So here we have water wet, um, so these are distributions of curvatures in an image like that, and you can see, we basically, for each capillary pressure, we need to have an average curvature, and that's the peak, um, kind of, that's kind of the mean. And for the water wet system, they're all over on the right, positive, and then they have a long tail to the left. And the, the long tail are the high curvature features like pendular rings, the little uh, orangey yellow things here. As the system uh, became more and more hydrophobic, 
interfaces started flipping the other way, and we were we could actually track that by measuring these curvatures at different saturation stages again. But you can see now the mean is over on the negative side, and the long tail goes out to the right. So you can effectively see how the system has gone from being hydrophilic to hydrophobic by looking at the curvatures of the mean. So that's been very helpful. I have one more slide I wanted to show you. Uh, this is work that's done by another group uh, that's working on this kind of um, research. Um, it's Martin Blunt's group at the Imperial College in, in uh, London. And these guys have actually figured out how to measure contact angles. And again, it's because they want to know what the wettability state of the particular rock that they're looking at, what, what that is. And you can see here they've gone in and actually measured contact angles from the images and plotted them up. Uh, they were looking at cardboard, the company is cardboard, so that, that's where they're coming from with this. But this is an opportunity as well. You can actually, the, the quality of images are getting so good now that you can actually start to, to determine the contact angles in 3D uh, inside your portion here. Okay, so I'm going to shift gears a little bit now. Um, this is work we've done to um, image biofilms, and a lot of people say, well, why would you use x rays? to image mm -hmm. biofilms. Biofilms are That's almost 100, it. It's 90 something percent more. What we really want to do is we want to see what biofilms are doing in relation to water. So we want to be able to separate the two. And the motivation is really coming from an environmental engineering perspective. We want to see if we, uh, if we set up a bioremediation scenario, we want microbes to degrade a contaminant. Um, where is the microbe growing in relation to the contaminant? Where is the, the microbe, the biofilm growing in relation to the nutrients that we're supplying to the system? So we really wanted to, to develop a technique that would allow us to image biofilms in 3D inside a porch medium. There's really no other technique that would do that. And focal imaging will give you 2D slices, but you can't look behind the grain. So the reason we're using x-rays is because we can look inside an opaque system but then to get contrast between the water and the biofilm, because it's a very similar, uh, similar makeup, we have to do something fairly creative in terms of uh, using contrast agents. So what we did in, in these experiments, we grew up the biofilm, and at the time we want to image it, we replace the water phase with a BAM sulfate suspension. BAM, uh, for those of you who have to drink one of those things and have a scan, uh, gives very high x-ray contrast. Um, we're actually using a medical grade uh, barium sulfate uh, suspension, and the suspension is so thick that it doesn't go into the biofilm, so we can separate the two. And what you can see then is that the beads or the grains stand out easily because they have high density. Um, X ray attenuation is directly related to uh, density and atomic number. Um, we then see very high attenuation also where the barium sulfate is, and then we identify the biofilm by elimination. Whatever is not one of the other is biofilm, so that's the rule of English here. And you can see we can get these kinds of images. We can actually see what the 3D architecture of that biofilm is inside the force medium. And in this case, you can see that the water has been flowing from, the, from the bottom to top because you can see these long streamers that form. So this has been very exciting because we can make all kinds of things. We can look at how much is the pore space clogging with biofilm in response to different kind of treatments. And I want to show you results from one particular study where we changed the flow rate. We used three different metal markers, three different flow rates, and we wanted to see what does that do to the amount of clogging we see in the pore space due to biofilm growth. And then uh, we used the cassini kármán equation here. Um, we, we took the change in porosity, we can measure that from the image, right? Um, we put that into the equation here, along with some, so the n is the porosity, and we have uh, uh, density, gravity, uh, characteristic force based and viscosity, and then from that we can back out the hydraulic conductivity or the permeability. And then what we wanted to um, compare was what kind of change in hydraulic conductivity do we do see due to the uh, clogging with biofilm? And because this was, again, method development, the first objective was to make sure that the measurements were right. So here we're comparing um, hydraulic conductivity change as it's measured from the images, those are the light points, and the darker points 
is measurements made by looking at the pressure drop across our sample measured externally with a pressure transfusion. So from that, we get a change in hydraulic conductivity. We can compare that to the hydraulic conductivity we get from the images, and you can see we actually got very nice correlation. I don't want to get into why it looks the way it does, because that's a whole other story. But this is another place where I think we can really use this technique to um, to get better at dealing with groundwater contamination, developing bioremediation scenarios. Uh, because if we can learn, if we have a technique that can actually show us what the biofilm is doing, well then we can, we can also do that. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about um, CO2 storage because that's something I've been working on uh, a bit lately. And there is, of course, uh, always the concern about what is going to happen to groundwater when we start injecting CO2 into the subsurface. We generally talk about four different storage mechanisms. Um, physical trapping, where you inject the CO2 under a catwalk, and then you cross your fingers and hope that there's, that catwalk is not in any way compromised. Um, there are no faults, there are no well wars or anything that allows the CO2 to migrate upwards. Um, what would happen then over time, the CO2 will dissolve into the brine, as I talked about earlier, and eventually you're going to form carbonate minerals, and that's the ultimate sequestration then. Now, these processes are kinetically quite slow, so the thing that we've been looking at is, is what's called capillary tracking, where we inject the CO2 into the pore space and we track it by capillary forces inside the host rock. So this is a sandstone, that would, this would be a, a potential host rock for CO2 storage, and you can see we have, we have CO2 stored in the pore space now, held there by capillary forces the way that water is held in this rock. And the idea is that it provides much safer storage because it can't go anywhere. Um, so the idea here is you inject CO2 into your storage formation. Uh, and one concern would, of course, be that if it leaks back up, it, it's going to eventually get to your groundwater aquifer. It will acidify your groundwater. And it will potentially uh, dissolve all kinds of undesirable constituents out of your, your groundwater reservoir. So we were trying to see, well, this capillary trapping mechanism might be able to help us um, because if we can trap the CO2 in the pore space and hold it there, it's not going to migrate upwards, but we're also going to drastically increase the surface area to volume ratio of that CO2, so the dissolution is going to go faster as well. So we're seeing this as a much safer storage mechanism in terms of not having CO2 leak up to our groundwater reservoirs after it's injected. So I just want to emphasize how it's done. We inject the CO2 into the ground. When we do that, the CO2 pushes the, the, the resident brine out of the system. And then you can either, you, when, once you turn off the injection, you can wait for the, for the water to come back in. And that's where we actually trap the CO2, when the water comes back in and surrounds the CO2. Uh, we're also working with engineering that step where we actually inject water instead of just waiting for, um, for the rest of the brine to come back. So uh, this is going to get a little bit mathematical. Um, I want to introduce something that's called the Euler characteristic, but I don't want you to think too much about where it's actually coming from. Uh, the one thing I want to point out is that to a mathematical topologist, a coffee mug and a donut are the same thing. They're topologically invariant. Um, so I want you to think about the Euler characteristic as a measure of connectivity of that injected CO2. So we have some examples here of different types of objects that have different Euler characteristics, right. indicating that they have different connectivity. They have a different number of redundant connections. Now the reason we're interested in this is that because of the way we're defining this Euler number, a low Euler number, after we've injected the CO2, low connectivity of that CO2 would uh, help us in trapping the CO2. So intuitively it makes sense, right? You inject the CO2 in such a way that it gets really, really fragmented. And then the water comes back and it's going to have a much harder time to mobilize that CO2 out of there, as opposed to if you have one very large, super well-connected CO2 block, you're just going to mobilize that out of the system again. So we've been using this measure this measure of topology that we can get from the images. We run experiments, we inject CO2, 
And then we, we come up with these kinds of plots where we can measure this Euler characteristic, this connectivity. And we can then see, as we expected, the, the lower the Euler number is, meaning the less well connected the CO2 is to itself after injection, the more efficiently we can track the CO2 um, once, once we get to the, the inhibition stage. So this is just uh, uh, what's there to begin with, so what's trapped over what's there to begin with. So it's really um, the efficiency of, of that trapping process. So of course, that has now led us to um, thinking, well, how do we do that? We, we want to now inject the CO2 in such a way that it's poorly connected to, it, to itself. And how do we actually do that? The goal, of course, is that if you can inject it so that it's, it's poorly connected, it's going to be easier to trap, harder to mobilize, and it's going to be very difficult for it to migrate up and, and contaminate our groundwater resources. So we have found, so with the, 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 the plot I showed you here was, done, was measured under ambient conditions. And one of the things that's been very important for us is to see if this whole concept of, of connectivity, you know, whether we can use that and go out and say to the person who's been running the injection, you really shouldn't be injecting this so that the CO2 is poorly connected. Well, we want to make sure that we do experiments with supercritical CO2 under real uh, reservoir conditions. So I have a couple of slides that shows you a little bit about how we've done that. And just to make sure that we're all in agreement why we're talking supercritical CO2 for storage, um, when you look at the uh, amount of, of space that uh, a unit of CO2 takes up as a gas, and then as you pressurize and you increase temperature as you go deeper and deeper into the ground, uh, you cross over the critical point at some point, and your volume, the, the storage space that you need to store the same amount of CO2 goes down drastically. So that's one of the reasons when, we, when we're thinking about storing CO2, we don't want to store it as a gas. Want to store it as a supercritical uh, fuel. So that's why we're doing the experiments uh, with, with that system. So we've uh, designed um, um, a setup in house, and we, we call it a mobile setup because once we had tested it and made sure everything was working back at my university, uh, we drove the whole thing out to Chicago um, because that's where the imaging facility is. And that's where it, it sits most of the time now. So we can run this at about 30 degrees C, 40 degrees C. Um, 1200 PSI, and um, so that would be about the, the supercritical point. And we're again looking at relatively small sample, quarter inch sample of a, a sandstone, a bedrock sandstone core. But because the sample is so small, we can get really high resolution. The image is about three or four microns. So we can really see what the CO2 is doing there. <clears throat> so here are a couple of 3D cutouts from. Uh, <coughs> Uh, the point where we start the, the injection of CO2, you can see we have some supercritical CO2 in the pore space here, and this is at the end of the injection. And here you can see we have very efficiently displaced all of the brine with CO2. And this is exactly what we don't want to do, right? Um, let me just show you a couple more slides that's, that's uh, kind of putting some numbers to this. This axis here is now the connectivity again, and here's the brine saturation. So as I go through the slides here, um, you'll see that this is a cross-section through the sample. The orange here is some uh, 3D uh, distribution of CO2, and then you'll see we march through the, the data points here. And you can see we're injecting CO2 from the top end of our sample here. We have more and more CO2 in the pore space now. We've got more connected according to this axis here. And you can actually see that we're, we're actually filling in behind the front. And eventually, we get to complete connectivity of the CO2. We have a, a connectivity of one. And like I said, this is exactly where we don't want to be, according to our ambient uh, predictions. But this was our first supercritical experiment, and we're now moving on. So we're, we're conducting additional experiments now where we're trying to see if, if the, the prediction we came up with based on the ambient experiment actually got a hold on the supercritical condition. And it does look like they did. Okay, so I've talked a lot about potential measurements we can make, how we can, we can use it to protect groundwater, um, how we can use it to clean up groundwater, uh, measure different things. Of course, the hurdle is always how do we get from this very, very small stuff to the very, very large scale. 
Um, but let me first talk about a little bit about what I think is, is going to happen in coming years. At this point, if you want to collect a 3D image, for those of you who've had a CAT scan, you know that they're going to tell you to lie still on the image that you can't move. Because that mathematical reconstruction of the, the 3D features, it doesn't work if the object is moving while you're trying to do that. But the scanning has now gotten so fast that at the rate that groundwater is flowing, we can image at the same speed. So we can now actually add a, a, a fourth dimension onto our images, which is time. So we can start following fluid movement. This is a sequence of images. You can see there's some fluid coming in at the bottom. And these images are collected as the fluids are moving. Where in the past, we had to stop the system, wait for it to calibrate, settle down, and then we would collect an image. So this is pretty exciting. Um, I think we're going to be able to, to measure uh, even more types of, of uh, interesting things. Um, some of the work here, this is done by Stefan Berg at, at Shell in the Netherlands. Uh, there's a lot of things happening in, in the petroleum field that's been helping drive this technique as well. But one of the things you can see here is we can actually see individual pore filling events now as they're happening. So as we go from one step to the next, you can see an individual pore fill while, while it's happening. So to those of us working on this kind of stuff, this, this is pretty exciting. Uh, maybe Haynes jumps are not that exciting to the general public, but it's certainly, you know, we're seeing, we're seeing new developments that are going to help us in the future um, in terms of, of uh, measuring these, these kinds of things. And I think one of the things that, when I started doing this kind of work, there was a tendency to, people would, uh, would collect these kinds of images, and then they would publish and hold them up and say, you know, they would have two slides and say, yeah, this one looks a little different, there's something happening up here. But there's really no excuse for not measuring things, for not making it quantitative. It's a little bit cumbersome, but you can measure, you can put numbers to all of these things, and you can develop trends, and you can learn, you can get a better conceptual understanding about how water flows inside pores with this technique. And hopefully we can use that to better protect groundwater or to clean up groundwater. Um, and I think in particular what's happening with uh, uh, hydraulic uh, fracturing uh, <coughs> activities that there might be additional needs for, for trying to look at this in terms of, of um, not uh, contaminating our groundwater any further. So my title there was hope. I, I hope, you know, I've shown you lots of pictures, but I hope you have gotten the sense too that they're not just pretty pictures that we can actually get quantitative information on. I already talked a little bit about what the, the limitation is in terms of sample size, the fact that if we want really high resolution, the sample tends to get a little bit small. Um, I have to answer enough questions about working on the micron scale. I don't actually want to go to the nano scale because I think in terms of fluid flow, it becomes almost ridiculous. Um, but if you're looking at geochemistry or something like that, it makes a lot of sense to look at what's going on at the nanoscale, especially with uh, shale gas um, and oil um, developments. Temporal resolution is still an issue when we're talking about the, the type of like a medical scan or the kind of uh, facility you might have in a, in a research lab. Synchron radiation sources, on the other hand, access is a problem. We get access to our equipment three times a year for three to four days, and the rest of the time it's exciting. Um, it's very, very stressful for the students and postdocs too, because it has to all work when they go and do it. Um, but looking into the future, I really think that, that we haven't reached the end of the road in terms of what the can be done with this. And with that, of course, I would like to acknowledge everyone who's contributed to this. Um, lots of really, really talented young people, uh, PhD students, master's students, and postdocs. Um, and our funding sources, and then of course I would again like to thank the National Groundwater Association for giving me the opportunity to travel around the world to talk about my work this year. And then I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank you.